Welcome to Renegade Thinkers Unite, featuring the sharpest minds in marketing, inspirational case histories, and weekly insights you can apply to your business. Find out why top CMOs rank this podcast among their favorites. Now, here's your host, Chief Marketing Renegade, Drew Neiser. So we're all students of marketing. I think so. I mean, I think we should be students of marketing. So it's appropriate that today we're recording an episode in the San Mateo Library. And we're recording this because my guest is Dave DC, who is the CMO at Trust Arc. Because after we record this, we're going to go to a CMO Club dinner. So hey, Pete, shout out to Pete Cranick, the gentleman who helped introduce us. And I want to go back to the notion of being a student and I know that part of this show for me is that I get an opportunity to interview so many amazing chief marketing officers. And when you look at Dave's career, it's really interesting. You spent time at AOL, you've spent eight years. That's a really, that's such a long term. If I did the average tenure and I eliminated one individual who has been on the show 20, who had been 20 years in the job, the average would be two. So eight years. It's a pretty significant uh, accomplishment. Anyway, Dave, welcome to Renegade Thinkers United. Well, thank you, Drew. I'm uh, happy to be here and uh, looking forward to our conversation. So let's, let's start with the big deal. And the big deal that I see, um, besides the fact that you've, you've, you've been able to just be in your role for as long as you have, is the name change. And let's take us back to why. You, the, the company was Trust E. Exactly. Uh, and, exactly. Right. And so talk about, so where were you and what was the moment where you said, we got to change your name? So just to give you the quick history, the company Trustee was founded in 1997. And what most people know Trustee for is the company that helped certify uh, business privacy practices. And if a company was certified, they were able to put the little green seal on their website. And most people have seen that green certified privacy seal on websites over the years. And as a result, the company Trustee built a very strong brand uh, name for the company, as well as a very strong brand recognition for that, um, for that green seal. And when I joined the company in 2011, at that point, it, it had already been up and running for about 13 years, but had been focused almost 100% on services. And I was brought in as part of a team that uh, was brought in after the company went out and raised venture capital funding with the goal of transforming it from a services company into a tech SaaS uh, company. Okay, so we have this sort of strong legacy brand, this business is churning along, there's recognition because people have seen it on the website, but you've decided that you want the company to be more than this one individual product line, right? You want it to, that's my guess, is exactly. you want to expand. Exactly. I mean, the whole purpose of raising money typically is to be able to do new things yes. and so forth. So as you were looking at the trustee brand, was the notion that it simply couldn't hold anything else, that it, it, it wouldn't be able to, uh, to sustain, uh, if you will, sub-brands or sub-services? That's exactly the issue that we were running into. What we were finding was, as we began to build out our technology products and uh, we continued to build our platform out, we were, get, we were having great success selling the product to customers, but the reality was it became, uh, with a lot of companies, difficult to convince them that we were a technology company because when they would hear the trustee name, they would immediately uh, think to themselves and say, that's right, you're the certification company. And so uh, we pushed on that hard for a couple of years and eventually came to the conclusion that as hard as we were trying, um, it was simply some uphill uh, friction or headwinds, if you will, that um, was becoming more and more difficult to overcome. And so that's when we began to actively uh, uh, take a, a hard investigation into, at a minimum, we needed to rebrand the company, but potentially we needed to go as far as actually uh, renaming the company. And that's when we began uh, that initiative. All right. So we've got that. We're at this pivotal moment. You can't grow the way you want to grow with the brand. And maybe there was a way to change the way E-Trust looked and feels so that people wouldn't just associate it with this one product. The alternative was, of course, to come up with another name, which we already know the end of the story is that, that you did. 
What were some of the critical steps that you went through to validate that one, um, it was really critical that you did change the name, and two, that, that TrustArc was the right name to change it to, other than the fact that it was available? <laughs> so there was a couple of things involved there. And so once we decided that we needed to undergo a, a major transformation, we decided that there was enough historical uh, heritage in the company name that we needed to get some outside help and so we hired an outside brand agency and brought them on board to help us go through this this process and really part of the early uh, process was we had them do some external validation with interviews with customers interview with partners and also interviews with 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 salespeople and other and other employees to start to float the idea of whether or not um, a name change made sense and overall the information that came back um, was pretty strong that trustee meant one thing and one thing only, which was certification services. And the data came back pretty strong that said you can, you're only going to be better off if you can come up with a, a, a new name for the company. Um, but there was a lot of strong goodwill with the trustee name, so part of the feedback was you should continue to use that name for the certification products, but it made sense to come up with a new company name. And so once we had that information, that's when, as we worked with the brand agency, that uh, we, we had them start to explore uh, new name possibilities for us. And so some of the criteria that we gave them, obviously we wanted something that was gonna help convey a tech company, a growing company, kind of a new and innovative company. Um, and at the same time, if there was some way for them to leverage some of the historical things like the word trust, which was uh, a key ingredient in the um, original company's brand, um, that was something that, um, that we were um, um, excited and interested in. And so they came back to us with a, with a pretty wide range of options, but along the way, one of the ones that they uh, produced was TrustArc. And so it was one of those moments where we had our entire exec team sitting in a conference room, and after they had gone through a number of names, they had saved this one to last, and then they presented uh, the, the TrustArc name, and immediately everyone looked around the room and said, hey, that's not bad leverages the name, uh, uh, the word trust, also introduces this idea of an arc, which is kind of a way of signifying kind of growth and transformation. And so we immediately um, fell in love with it. And then the immediate question became, is this domain name available? And um, they actually had not checked ahead of time at the meeting. And so we all sat there and said, let's check and see if the name's available. And again, it was one of these interesting experiences where we found that somebody else owned it but it happened to be a website that was in the business of selling domain names, and the price was $5,000. Oh. Our CEO pulled out the credit card, we immediately bought the domain name, and literally within a matter of seconds, we owned the name. What a great story. And uh, first of all, uh, for a branding agency to not, as you get them, that was a moment that they should have checked. You know, that would be the same thing as you, for the folks that are listening, there is a, a wonderful website as well that the U.S. government, uh, the patent office runs that you can also do trademark searches really quickly. And so before we ever go in and ever show a tagline or something like that, we always put it in there just in case. And literally, we're about days away recently to present a big idea and of course, and it had already been registered. So, um, well, the, what an amazing thing. And by the way, if you thought 5,000 um, was high, you're just, you haven't been going through this because we're seeing folks that are looking at names that, you know, were six figures, uh, and which is so painful. So there you are, that's a moment. And the minute he put the credit card on the table, you kind of knew you were all in on that, I imagine. Exactly, exactly. And one quick follow-up comment on your uh, references to, the, you know, the, the cost of getting a domain name. It's, it's, it's part the cost sometimes, but um, the other challenge is simply it's amazing until you go into one of these searches that virtually every name that you can think of is, is already registered. And so literally what you're often left with, um, if, if you don't want to pay a high fee to acquire an existing domain name, is coming up with either um, you know, an incorrect spelling, right, which is a common thing of a common word, right. you spell it differently, or you come up with an extremely long compound name that ends up becoming very difficult for people to, uh, to pronounce or to, to spell. And so um, it is one of the trickier parts of, uh, uh, of branding that people don't quite realize until, until they get into it. Yeah, and I think it's really important also that uh, just to punctuate, one of the things that we talk a lot about with our clients, and by the way, Renegade is not in the naming business, but 
our clients do go through this process is never have a name that you can't own the URL. <laughs> it's just too complicated. You will really create all sorts of issues. And by that, I mean the .com. There are folks that will buy an AI or some other things. And like, let's face it, Bitly, it's worked for them. Um, but uh, there are very few brands, I think, that uh, feel bad about owning the .com. Um, and I know lots of brands who own alternatives that sort of struggle for recognition. It creates email problems and so forth. All right, so really seriously, when you have a new name, if you are lucky enough to find one and it clears trademarks, make sure you can get the URL. And if you have to buy it, um, don't negotiate to buy it from the organization. Uh, if it, for example, if you can just buy it straight out because you see the price and they're selling it. But if you have to actually go and negotiate, get a third party to help you out because uh, otherwise, if they see you're a big company, they're gonna want big money. Um, any last thoughts on, on just the getting the name part of this um, before we, we take a break? Yeah, I think just the, the other part of it is that even though at that point it, it seemed like everything was a done deal with respect to the name change, the reality was there were there were still some other uh, some other people that needed to be sold along the way. So things like the like our board, for example, um, and so we we were at a good shape in the in, in the process. There were still some additional people that need uh, needed to be sold on the on the matter. Uh, but the reality was that really was just the beginning part of the process because we still had to work through uh, the new identity and then eventually roll that out across all of our collateral and, and sales tools and different things like that. And so while it seemed like um, uh, mission accomplished, the reality was uh, the journey had just begun at that point. Perfect place to take a break. We'll be right back. Did you know that Renegade Thinkers Unite was ranked number two of the top 10 podcasts for CMOs by Cracker Jack Marketing? Wow, we're really honored. Now, we couldn't do that without amazing guests, and we've had some amazing CMOs on this show, and also terrific listeners like you all. If you like what we do here, please subscribe on your favorite podcast player. That way, you'll never miss an episode. Also, as a special thanks, I'd like to send you a free ebook on Renegade Thinkers. Now, for that, just email drew at renegade.com. Now, let's get back to the show. Okay, we're back. And we've been talking about you have a new name. But, and as you said, this is just the beginning because there's so much work to be done. Uh, without going through every detail, what were some of the sort of surprising hurdles in this process before you sort of launched it that you think were sort of the, the key critical moments for you on, on this? So I think once the, the, the name change part was agreed to, which, and, and, and to be honest, it was surprisingly how easy within our executive team, how, how everyone did bond on, a, on an individual name. The next part was looking at the, at the broader identity, right? So things like the logo, what was the logo going to look like and what kind of um, bug or symbol would we potentially want to incorporate it into the, into the logo and a tagline and colors and things like that. And so that I have often found um, can be one of the more challenging things because everybody in their spare time is a designer. And so the, the color part of it, we were actually able to get agreement on pretty quickly because again, part of the guideline we went into this was uh, the historic company colors were green. And so we said we really wanted to leverage the green. We were open to uh, a variation on it, but we wanted to leverage the green. And there were some other simple things like we switched from black as the second color to blue as the second color. But where we had a lot of internal debate and probably took longer than the actual name uh, change part was what was the logo going to look like and what was, again, that kind of the bug or, or symbol going to look like that would go along with the logo. And this is a really interesting part of this is there's sort of, do you look backwards at the old brand and you say, oh, there's some legacy things there that we'd like to keep, as you said, the green color, or do you just rip the brand aid because you're really trying to say to the marketplace, we're a different company. And can you do that sort of incrementally? And it, and it seems like you sort of, you, you one hand, you took the green, changed it a little bit, so that's a signal, but you kept some things. From a design standpoint, how, hard was it to sort of move 
really a way into a fresh territory because everybody's comfortable with what they know, right? The funny thing about logos is I, I'm just imagining people the first time they saw the backwards E in Intel. They probably thought that was the stupidest thing they ever saw. Now we've seen it a billion times. It takes a long time for a logo to sort of burn in, if you will, and then when you change it, um, like if, if suddenly you saw the IBM logo changed or the Nike logo change, it would be kind of sort of disruptive for you. And you might say, as people often do, I hate it. <laughs> so how did you sort of deal with that sort of incremental, big step? What was your approach? So I think part of what we concluded along the way was we, while we wanted, it, we wanted a big transformation, again, we did not want to throw away the past because as I alluded to a little bit earlier, when we did the interviews with, with customers, there really was um, an overall positive uh, sentiment toward, toward the trustee name and, and the trustee brand. And so it wasn't as much trying to run away from that as it was let's, let's leverage the good parts, but let's change enough in order to help, help create the new identity. And so the, uh, the big part of the process that, that came next was uh, going through the process of trying to figure out, okay, just sitting to, you know, directly to the left of the words trust arc, what kind of symbol or, or bug were we going to put there? And so this is where the, the brand agency came back with a wide, you know, a wide range of options. We had everything from arrows to uh, the letters TA um, you know, formatted different ways and we had circles and dots and different things. And we had a million different opinions on what, what people liked and didn't like. And then one of the options that came um, along was um, a single arc, right? So um, which tied into the, into the trust arc name. And early on, there was um, some positive uh, uh, sentiment within the group for that, but it wasn't quite simply resonating with everyone. And then um, they did a simple change where they introduced a second arc. And then all of a sudden it became two arcs looks better than one for some reason. People were getting a little bit warmer. And then one day I kind of gave the group the task. I said, look, um, you know, I, I see a lot of companies where uh, they've incorporated animals and different things like that. Why don't you just get crazy and, and, and see if there's, there's something like that that you can do? And what they ended up coming back with was, if you can imagine again, and if you look at our logo, there's these two arcs um, to the left of the name where they came back and they put a little fin um, at the time, we didn't know it was a fin. I just thought it was like a, a little bump on one of the arcs. And I said, what is that? And um, they said, that's the fin of a dolphin. And I said, well, why are there dolphins in our, um, in our logo? And they said, well, you asked us to get creative and try to come up with, with something a little bit different. And I said, okay, but, but why dolphins? And they came back with, it, with a story about how, well, first off, obviously the dolphin fit with the arc. But then um, they came back with a lot of um, uh, symbolism around the idea that uh, dolphins are very intelligent. They're actually uh, they're very fierce animals. Uh, at the same time, they're also very friendly. And in general, people like dolphins. And so um, pretty quickly, they sold us on this notion that the arcs with a little bump on it became this idea of uh, the dolphins. And while there's nothing to do between uh, dolphins and privacy, all of a sudden it started to tie the identity together in a nice, in a nice way. I love that story. And so well, first one, uh, kudos to you for asking a question like that. And I just want to sort of for a moment, if you're listening CMOs, when was the last time you told your agency, hey, go crazy, add animals, see what happens just for fun. You open the door to creativity, which is really important Two. Um, I love the fact that, and this is what, you know, doing a podcast is so fun, is you just, I never expected we'd be talking about dolphins in an identity program. I did notice the fin, but I didn't, it didn't, I just sort of thought, oh, that's cool, there's a fin. Uh, so I'm curious now, so now you have a dolphin in, in your logo, and uh, you just keep moving from there. How did, um, how did you then sort of say, okay, we have the logo now, how did you introduce this uh, uh, and roll it out uh, both internally and externally. So before I comment on that real quick, just one, one more comment on the dolphin, which is the, 
there were, you know, once people got warmed up to the idea, when I say people, we had a pretty close-knit group of just our executive team that, that was really in the know that anything was going on with respect to a name change and different things like that. There was still a lot of back and forth debate internally around, well, what are people externally going to say about a dolphin? Is that going to reflect positively or re reflect negatively? Um, and uh, I'll jump fast forward a little bit and then, and then we'll come back. But one of the things that we eventually found once we actually rolled out the new logo with the dolphin and everything, I'd say for about the first 24 to 48 hours, we had people ask, hey, what is that, what is that little hump on the, uh, on the arc for? And we explained to people that it was uh, you know, the symbolizing dolphins. And um, that was it. That was pretty much, and I'd say after about two days, we never, uh, we never had anyone ask about it again. Um, but if I go back to the, the question around the process of rolling it out, and so you know, once we had agreement on the name change, on the symbol and everything, um, then we had to go through a, a pretty big exercise to start redesigning all of our collateral and the website and different things like that. So without getting into all of the, all of the details there, that was a pretty time consuming exercise that took um, took probably about four to eight weeks um, mm. to, to be able to work through through all of those different materials. In terms of the actual rollout, uh, there was a pretty elaborate plan that we had put in place around everything around how do we start communicating it internally, number one, and then number two, how do we, how do we communicate it externally? And so... Uh, oh, that's, that's awesome. I, I just wanted to pause for a second on the internal thing, because this is the thing that uh, whenever uh, I... I hear about these programs oftentimes because there's a trade show coming up or there's a press release that needs to get out the internal rollout is is given short shrift how long did you allow for the internal I'd say the actual internal rollout was probably just a couple of weeks mm -hmm. um, depending on whether you consider that long or short um, part of it obviously is putting in perspective that the size of the company so our company is about 350 people uh, obviously, we could do an internal rollout a lot faster than a, a company of 35,000 people, for, um, for example. And so um, a lot of effort went into uh, uh, building out everything from presentations on why we were doing the name change. We incorporated some of the information in there around the customer interviews that we, that we did and different information. We built FAQs and, um, and, and held a number of all-hands all meetings. Um, had all of the execs involved in that in that process and, and communicating the information and um, but you know over the course of a couple of weeks we were able to uh, get that information communicated and also be able to um, to start to train people on the new messaging the, the one other quick uh, comment on the the internal rollout is you can't allow too much time because we had not started to publicly announce that externally yet and so you've got to do the internal messaging rollout fairly quick so that you can then follow on with the external rollout otherwise you risk the the the, uh, the, the naming is going to get out there uh, uncontrolled right okay perfect uh, all right uh, so just the last question I'm just on this part of it swag for the employees so the swag, as you can probably imagine, included uh, a number of things with um, dolphin themes. Uh, everything from uh, little st uh, stuffed dolphin animals to t-shirts with dolphins on them and, 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 and pens and, and, and various other things. Um, and I will have to say, by far and away, the, the most popular items were the, the little stuffed um, uh, dolphins which initially that was something that we only planned for employees that we actually thought that wouldn't be the, the type of thing that would make sense for some of the trade shows and events because we, we sell to uh, uh, lawyers, people with legal backgrounds and people with compliance backgrounds and so the thought was little stuffed animals wouldn't necessarily uh, be that um, uh, uh, um, you know something in demand by them but the reality is we experimented with one event and it actually turned out to be a very hot um, item uh, I love this story I mean we're gonna have to come back and talk more about dolphins T uh, stay with us you've been listening to another great interview on renegade thinkers unite with drew Neiser. but the value doesn't end there as a listener you can download a free ebook from drew Renegade Thinkers, interviews with 11 trailblazing CMOs any business can learn from, top marketing thought leaders and proven executives from Time Warner, American Express, and Chico's, and others. Get your free copy at renegadethinkersunite.com slash ebook for listeners only at renegadethinkersunite.com slash ebook.
Okay, we're back. And can I just pause for a moment and revel in this notion? So many B2B brands think about their trade shows as a place to push rational information to their target about their product and how wonderful it is. And you just shared that by having stuffed dolphins, which no doubt the folks, one, it created curiosity, but two, they probably wanted to take it home to their children, prove that even that your lawyers and compliance professionals are like real people who like stuff. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, without going too far off, one of the things we, we have found over the years is some of the, some of the crazier swag and giveaways are, are quite often some of the more um, some of the more popular ones and interesting ones. I mean, we've given away uh, literally things like yo-yos, and it's amazing how many people come up and will say, wow, a yo-yo, I haven't, I haven't touched one of these in years. And the next thing you know, you've got people showing off their tricks uh, that, they were, that they were doing as a kid and um, uh, bringing back some of those, some of those memories. Oh, I, I could do that. I think I it was Rock the Cradle was one of my favorite exactly, uh, yes. yo, yo, yo-yo tricks. Uh, first time mentioned uh, some of my uh, past yo-yo uh, a youth uh, misspent. So anyway, we're back to dolphins. Now, uh, you do this at trade shows. Um, were there any other sort of big moment portions of the relaunch when you, when you brought it out to the, to the rest of the world past employees? Yeah, I, I mean, there, there were a couple of other things I'll just hit on as, as part of the rollout. Um, so one of the things was we actually did a big launch party. Um, and so we did that. We're based in San Francisco. We, we did that in San Francisco at a, uh, a nice event downtown. And that actually was a great opportunity for us to, number one, bring all the employees together. Um, number two, we actually invited kind of all the past employees together. So it was a good way to, to sort of network and bring um, a lot of the former employees to, uh, uh, back together for a big celebration. And then we also invited all of our customers and, um, and, and partners from the uh, uh, from the local Bay Area, and so that was probably the big signature event, and in in the end, ended up being the um, that ended up being sort of the anchor date. Because what I have found with this project and most projects is you ultimately need a launch date, or things can kind of move on uh, forever. And so ultimately, for us, we 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 picked a launch date when we had to put the deposit down and reserve a place that could you know that could hold 500 people. Then that became the crowning moment where where everything had to be done and um, um, in place by. So, okay, so, you know, I thought for a moment maybe you were going to do the launch party at Marine Land, but uh, I get it. It would have been a little tough. Uh, so, you do this. You, the, the new brand is out there. Were, what were some of the early, what were the metrics that you were looking for and using to, to sort of know that you were on the right path, that this program was, uh, if you will, the inoculation was taking? Sure. So I think the main, the main metrics we were looking at was what was both the external and the internal reaction. And I'll start with the, in, you know, the internal side because the, you know, even though to a large degree, you know, once you got beyond the executive team, you had, um, you had general buy-in across the employees. I would say that the longer somebody had been with the company, the more they were nervous about the, uh, the, the name change. And I often measure the, um, the success of marketing programs by how many salespeople complain about it and how quickly they complain. And this is probably one of the, the few programs that I've ever launched where literally I didn't get a single sales rep complaint and um, for the most part actually got, got compliments and praise, which for those of us in the marketing world know um, it's not often that you get the, uh, the, the sales team actually going out of their way uh, to, say, to say positive things. So from an internal standpoint, to, again, to a large degree, we really use the feedback from the, from the sales team. From an external uh, standpoint, again, to a large degree, we use the feedback from customers. Um, and so in the very early days of um, going out and doing the communication, and the communication was done through, through a, 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 you know, a multiple of um, um, uh, avenues beyond the launch party. We sent emails out to all of our customers, emails out to all of our prospects. There was obviously a press release and a, and a blog post um, and a number of different communication channels. All of our top customers got phone calls uh, from a sales rep or somebody else in order to, um, to introduce the, the, the feedback. And the number one kind of most universal uh, piece of feedback we got from people was, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Why did you wait so long? Right. 
That's a, which is which a pretty good indication that all everything is good. And I, now one of the big challenges, of course, is um, when you change your name, you change your domain, and you can lose your your site traffic. You have to start from scratch. But I imagine because you kept the trustee product as a product, I'm kind of thinking in my mind that you kept that website sort of alive for a while uh, before migrating and so you have this sort of new parent company, if you will, and you keep the product alive. Is it, is it, was there some kind of migration plan like that? So there were, there were a ton of different migration things that we had to work through. And so not only did you have to work through some of the migration around things like the URL, but you also, all of your social media uh, pages as well, right? So you had, to, you had to work on a migration strategy for LinkedIn and for Facebook and, and, and for Twitter. Um, I think at one point, the master list of, um, of total uh, different project to-dos was well over 100 items that we needed to work on um, in order to complete the, the transition because you had all of your different online, uh, online uh, activities and URLs and accounts that you had to transition. But again, literally you had to, um, you know, we had a, you know, probably 100 plus different um, sales tools that all had to get converted over into the, um, into the new identity. You've got hundreds of pages on, um, on, on your website. So it was, it was pretty extensive. Everything from, um, sometimes you're, you don't even realize how many places you use a company name until you go through a process like this. Changing the, the voice greetings on, um, you know, the 800 number recording and different things like that. Having all of the employees update their email signatures and update their voicemail greetings, having employees go in and update their individual LinkedIn profile so that they no longer referred uh, to the old company name. And so the list really um, uh, that does go on and on and on. Wow, yeah, I, I, I'd like a copy of that list. Uh, <laughs> that would be really, really helpful. Um, so as we're, as we're wrapping up and you're thinking back on this, uh, on this program, and let's say you were about to, God forbid, embark on it again, what were the sort of two or three key pieces of advice that you would offer your fellow CMOs on, on this process? Sure, I, I think it falls into a couple of areas. First and foremost is, obviously you gotta have um, a strong buy-in by the most uh, senior person in the company. In our case, it was the CEO. Um, so you need to have strong buy-in and support from the CEO that this is something that um, that, that the company is, is supportive of and wants to do. So that's number one. Number two is you got to have a uh, strong set of objectives that you're trying to accomplish because there were many times throughout the uh, process of the project where you uh, would start to go astray and you needed those strong, um, uh, those strong objectives to be able to come back to and kind of uh, uh, help keep things in line. And I would say number three is strongly consider bringing in some outside expertise to help with the process because uh, things like the brand and the, and the corporate I identity, there's often just uh, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, emotional equity that people have invested in what's currently there. And it's a very difficult process to, uh, to get people to change some of those thoughts working from within. And so bringing somebody in from the outside both helps bring some of that, um, that outside expertise, but they also help bring that objective thinking that um, helps make it easier to be able to introduce change in the organization. Yeah, it's a great list and I would add to that because one of the things that you did uh, when working with this outside partner is you, you said, hey, go crazy a little bit, just find something and, and that just that pure question um, inspired them to do something that ended up creating a, a, a little quirky a bit uh, to the story. Um, is there any don'ts that you would uh, say, don't, whatever you do, don't do this? Well, I think, again, it gets back to uh, the thing I commented on a, a couple of minutes ago around having, um, having a good objective. I think the opposite of that is, like, don't, don't change your company name without having, a, without having a good solid reason. And so what you don't want to do is embark on a name change simply because somebody says, well, I, I don't like our current name or I, I wish we had a different name. So there needs to be good, good solid foundation for, um, for why you're trying to do something like that, I think, is one. The second one is, and I think you alluded to this a little bit earlier, is you can't rush it. Right. This is something that we actually did it in what I think was was pretty fast timing, probably end to end. The, the entire project took uh, roughly between four and six months. 
it's something that is going to take is going to take some time, and you need to be careful not to just to have some arbitrary deadline and um, and try to rush it and then risk making a bad decision. But you need a deadline, at which you you pointed out. So, wow, I think this is an is it just a great it's a great story and it's a tight one. So have a good reason, obviously, for doing this. Uh, you had your executive committee bought in all the way along the way, and and to tr the the tada moment happened together. I think that uh, it's really, the CEO does need to be involved in this process. They have to, um, they have to embrace it. Um, and and when, when you finally pick one, they have to be able to stand in front of the organization and really champion it. They can't sort of, they can't hide. I think that's so important. So you get this done and uh, you, you look back on it and you say, what did it ultimately enable you to do? Sure. What I think the, the name chain to help, help us do was a couple of things. It, it helped us start to tell the story uh, more confidently around the fact that we were a technology company. And so you could almost see it immediately where our sales team felt more confident going out and telling prospects that, hey, we're not just a services company. We're now a full-fledged uh, full fledged technology company. And that confidence um, uh, literally helped start to translate into more sales. And so... As, as, as the team out there selling got more confident, you could just see the overall confidence level in the company start to grow. And um, we saw um, over time a significant uptick in our uh, sales trajectory. And ultimately, um, it helped us uh, lead to a, uh, a large funding round a couple of months ago where we closed a big $70 million uh, funding round. And there you have it. Uh, so a name can make a big difference. It really can, and uh, it's just you, you've given me lots of things to think about as, uh, as a couple of our clients are thinking about name changes so that this couldn't have been more timely. All right, well, so I think we've learned a lot. Uh, I think the library setting was, was really important here. Um, brand matters, um, and the brand that you have may or may not be the brand that you need. Um, the fact that you, you have a brand that is known, you can't underestimate that importance, but you can't sort of, you can get stuck. And it, it felt like this was an organization that had a great product name, but not a great platform name. They needed something that they could step up to uh, and build underneath. Um, interestingly now, you're kind of a house of brands now though. You're, you've got Trust Arc and Trustee stays around, right? Exactly. We, we definitely continued the, 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 the trustee brand for the, the certification offerings and TrustArc reflects both the, the corporate parent name as well as the brand for all of our technology offerings. Right. Perfect. And the two of those have, have worked quite well. Um, the market has accepted those as two uh, kind of complementary offerings. Yeah, and I, I think it's really convenient that they both have the word trust in it, so it's really easy to do it. Did you change the trustee logo at all at, at any point to try to align it with the trust arc? Was there any thoughts on that area? We did not. We debated it and just ultimately decided that it was recognizable and um, there was no sense changing it. The one uh, change that we did do is if you see now any of the trustee certified privacy seals um, on websites, we added a Powered by TrustArc uh, tagline to the bottom. And that was a way for us to be able to uh, leverage the reach of all those trustee seals on all the, those websites to help get more of that, that TrustArc brand out there and also just help reinforce uh, the fact that even though the certifications are services, we're actually using the TrustArc technology platform to power the delivery of those services. So that worked out nicely. Okay, so one last question is, this is an interesting one. So let's, the, the rebrand was successful. You're in the market, you're known now as a technology company broader than the original product that you started with. You just get $70 million in venture capital funding. And I'm really curious as a CMO, the, that's a moment where there's, there's kind of a land grab and the sales guys say, hey, we should hire 100 more sales folks. And the R&D people say, we need like 5,000 more engineers. And then there's the CMO says, you know, guys, we, we still need to spend a little more on marketing. How did you sort of go about that, uh, that you know, sort of land grab? That's a great question. And, and so I, I think that the, the key to think about in our market right now is, I think as most people know, 
privacy is becoming more and more complex for companies because of all these new regulations, which means there's more requirements that they need to deal with. And so the reality is, um, I, I as a marketer, while I know that we need to invest more in marketing and, and more in sales, I also recognize that we need to continue to invest in product. And so in the case of our company, the top priority is actually, um, and I'm fully supportive of, continuing to hire more engineers to make sure that we can build out that product because um, there's nothing better than having great products to be able to market. And so uh, a big focus will be on further building out the product. But then again, of course, there's going to be a big focus on further expanding the marketing and sales efforts um, as we continue to expand our operations beyond the U.S. as well as into additional sales channels. We're going to be equally investing in marketing and sales. Perfect. All right. Well, I think that'll do it for this episode. Dave, Dave thank you so much for being on the show. Drew, thank you very much as well. And to you uh, listeners, um, maybe you want to go in the library today and just sort of investigate something interesting that you haven't thought about. Uh, I certainly am inspired just walking in the door and watching all these kids sort of looking at the books going, yeah, libraries are really cool places. Uh, anyway, uh, I think the only thing I'm going to add, if you, if you got something out of this show, do me a favor, go over to iTunes right now and rate the show six stars. I know you can only get five, but I love that Drift did uh, their CEO asked for six stars. And uh, until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong. <laughs>